I know him as a very passionate and compassionate human being. He's driven by vision and by purpose. And this you see translated into everything that the Gift of the Givers does. Africa has a reputation for being on the receiving end of aid. But one man's mission is helping to change this perception. Today, we're taking you to the very heart of humanitarianism and bringing you the story of Dr. Imtia Suleiman, the founder of the largest response agency of African origin, the Gift of the Givers. In 1990, following a civil war in Mozambique, a young Dr. Suleiman, who had only been practicing medicine for four years, led a team of volunteers to deliver aid. Unbeknownst to him, this would be the beginning of a lifelong mission and a calling of sorts. But the thing that finally changed was in 1990, when I went to Mozambique. But what struck me more than anything, I was not the fighting. I saw these two little black kids. They were digging a hole, and I thought they were building a sand castle. And when the hole was about half a meter deep, they actually put their hand in the bottom to drop some water. And I asked them, my guide, I said, do they, people in Mozambique drink water this way? Why is, are these kids doing this? Is it some kind of a game they play? He said, my friend, there's a drought in Mozambique. There's no water. We've got big rivers, we've got the big sea, but there's no drinking water. And I froze. It hit me, the reality of having no water. I came back and I launched a project to help people of Mozambique. We put in 30 wells, we supported the hospital, we paid salaries of doctors. And that was the first project that I thought, okay, it's over. And just a few weeks later, when the Gulf War broke out, people said, you know what, you've marketed Mozambique, why don't you do something for the Gulf War? And then I did that. And then a few months later, there was a cyclone in Bangladesh. And the real change came in the same year, in 91, when I met a spiritual teacher in Istanbul. It was as a result of that cyclone that I was forced to go to, to, to Turkey. Dr. Suleiman is on a spiritual mission. He was given an instruction from a Sufi teacher to actually put this organization in place to help any nation, any religion, any nationality. And he lives by that credo. So for him, it's a higher level purpose that drives absolutely everything that he does. Two years after getting the instruction from his Sufi, he quit his private practice and traded his white coat for a life of alleviating the suffering of others on a much bigger scale. It was a Thursday night, the 6th of August, 1992. They had a spiritual program. After the prayer, he just turned and he looked at me and he said, you will form an organization. The name will be Gift of the Givers. You will not, I'm not asking you, I'm instructing you. You will serve all people of all religion, of all races, of all classes, of all colors, of all political affiliations, and of any geographical location. And you will serve them unconditionally. He had that spiritual link and inclination that he, would, he is being chosen to some degree that he will provide assistance to those in need in various forms and fashions as a vehicle and it's God helping others through him. What starts to happen to you as you confront the magnitude of seeing people in triage? And the most important thing is you cannot be emotionally attached. So when I go to a war zone, I, people ask me, how are you? I said, I have compassion and I, I'm ice cold at the same time. They can't understand that. I have compassion generally, people I need, but I'm ice cold when it comes to an individual. I don't get attached to an individual in, in, in the area that I work in. But the moment I, I get attached, my mission is over because I will not be able to function. I'll start crying, I'll get weak, you know, I won't be able to concentrate. So I said, okay, when a child is dying in front of me, I'm unmoved. Sorry to say that, but I'm unmoved. But if I don't do that, I'm trying to worry about one child, I lose the thousands that I'm supposed to help. It affects me, yes, in terms, the compassion is getting greater. Does it get heavy? Yes, it gets very heavy. People call you a number of things, you know, not just doctor, but doctor savior. Do you consider yourself a savior? No. I just consider myself fortunate to be, maybe presumptuous, to be, but to be selected to do what I do. Because they say that's only a grace and a favor from God Almighty. Most recently, Dr. Suleiman and his team defied the South African government and went into Syria, risking their lives and the wrath of the country's army, all in a bid to bring much needed relief to the afflicted. The world was not responding to Syria, and the world really is still not responding to Syria. You got into trouble for that as well. Yes. and. I mean, they said I mean, the question with the SA government, like how could you do that? Yeah. Who authorized you to go there? No, no, it wasn't so, it wasn't so blatant. They told, I had a discussion, pre-discussion with them, and they told me, you know what, we will be unhappy if you go into Syria. Mm -hmm. Probably security concerns, you know, not diplomacy, diplomacy issues. issues. You, you don't seem to be deterred by that, no, are you? No, I told them I'll go in illegally. I said it bluntly. I will go in illegally and nobody will stop me. 
I said the world spends a lot of money planning how to bomb other people, how to destroy lives, but they spend very little time in planning how to save lives. And I don't follow international law, I follow God's law. So if somebody wants to stop me, they're welcome to shoot me, you know? Have you been stopped? No. The Not only thing that will stop me will be a bullet, nothing else. Nothing. Nothing. All. I crossed the borders illegally. I have to do that, and I did it. And not, we, we were not silent about it. We filmed it, and the media showed it to the world, and we really don't care. But that makes you a rogue. That makes you a target. That makes you someone people want to stop. Yes. Well, they're welcome to do that. Mm. But it doesn't deter me. It's simply for that reason people have been, 120,000 people have died in Syria, because everybody is saying, you know what, you can't do this, you can't do that. Who determines that? By what law? Sure. So, sorry. So it's about the end for you, not the means? No, it's the end. The end is saving lives. And if people find saving lives offensive, mm -hmm. so be it. What are the highlights of this job for you? What's a good day for you? The good day to me is to see a smile on somebody's face. It's just unpractical for me. The smile I'm talking about, it's not an ordinary smile. It's a smile masking something very intense. Take Syria, for example. A seven-year-old walks with a bowl of olives towards you. And we ask, what is this? They say, you got to eat. I said, why do we have to eat? It's a war situation. They say, you're the guest, they're the host. The teaching is that the guest takes priority over everything else. I said, if I eat the food, there'll be nothing left. They said, that's not your concern. You have to eat, otherwise you insult them. You finish the bowl of olives with other people around you. Quietly, in discussion, you hear, the next meal they will get is in 10 days. You finish the olives, the child gives you a smile, a big smile, because she fulfilled her duty to you. As a, as a host and you were the guest. But that same smile covers the fact that for the next 10 days she's not going to eat food, she may have to drink boiled grass water. That's not an ordinary smile. So when I tell you, I put a smile on the faces of people, not me, it's to God's grace. You see, when people get the aid, when they get the supplies, when they get the food, I know the background where the smile is coming from. Since its establishment 21 years ago, the organization has given more than a billion rand in aid in 37 countries, including South Africa. But what keeps volunteers going back to danger zones and disaster areas where no safety is guaranteed? There's two parts to this. First of all, it's the quality of South Africans, the Ubuntu-driven nature of our people. They couldn't have got that after talking to me for five minutes on the phone. No, it has to be something that's innate within them. The second thing is, Many of those people have been on missions with me before. And it may not be necessarily a war, it may be an earthquake or something else, and they've seen that. And they like the system. We take a lot of precautions. Yeah. I go myself alone, first to check. And because of that, they trust me. And I never allow anybody to go without me, especially in a disaster or a dangerous zone where you can get shot. I'm the leader. So if something happens, I get shot first. His passion for humanity is much more fervent than it was 21 years ago when his mission began. He's not only elevated the country's image and its spirit of Ubuntu, but he has brought hope in the face of carnage and human suffering, restoring faith that there are a lot of good men and women out in the world. His big heart and selflessness will forever be the gift that keeps on giving.